All right, we're going to get started here. I know we have limited time, so I want to make the most of it. Uh, welcome everybody to this fourth 1559 coordination call, uh, fourth and probably the last ahead of the London Fork, which is next week. I'm sure you're all aware of it. Um, it's going to land around, I think, 12 UTC on Thursday, um, August 5th, depending on block time. So I'm sure we're all very excited. I know I am. Um, so I believe I put the agenda in the chat. You can check that out if you want, but this is a very open session. Um, I think a few of the, we have a few wallet teams here. I don't know what it makes sense to start with. Um, if anybody has any pressing discussion points they wanna bring up before we get into some demos, I'm open to hearing that. Richard, you're unmuted, so. All right, I said one quick comment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that as you wanna talk, go ahead. I mean, it's just a very quick thing. I think it's useful if everyone changes their name in this chat to the project they're working on. Sure. If you want to, you don't have to, it's just a suggestion. Oh, I see uh, Tim is joined. Tim, I don't know if you want to lead off with any general comments or links to anything. I can share the, the RPC doc that you put together. Um, yeah, I mean, if anyone has has like questions or things they want to bring up first, we can do those. But otherwise, yeah, we can uh, we can kind of share some updates, I guess, from, from our end and, and start that way. Yeah, go ahead. Whatever you've got. Start with oh. Uh, okay, so there's a question uh, from Santiago. We can start there. Uh, so, whether there's any gas price oracles, eat gas station, get now, gas now working on 1559. Um, I don't know if any of them. Oh, yeah, we have someone from eat gas station on the call. Two people, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I'm Andre here. Yeah, working for eat gas station. Uh, so, yeah, indeed, yeah, we are looking into this. Uh, yeah, we've been working on this this month. Uh, we probably won't make it exactly to the same uh yeah to the to the next week but yeah pretty much like maybe the week after or something so yeah the idea is to give some um tipping minor tipping uh estimation for the coming blocks to get included so pretty much what we got so far but yeah uh, with the tipping uh change I'm curious if you can share this publicly, but like, how are you approaching, like adding, like, how are you approaching estimating the tips? And if you can't share it, uh, because that's like your secret sauce, that's fine, but yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty much what's been shared on, what is this uh, uh, page? Yeah, I can't remember this. Uh, yeah, it's basically like uh, pretty close to the Perus uh, approach we, 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 we have, uh, like checking the, last 100 200 blocks uh and then trying to find like the uh the quantile out of it uh for the tipping uh field and yeah uh given certain quantile we, we we will share like for given like uh standard or fast or or yeah ultra fast line for the next block for oh yeah the transaction to get included in the block these details we we still need like to yeah to tweak some stuff and yeah those details the implementation detail we most likely uh, share uh, some of it so yeah as we get the thing like more clear and more like uh, in shape then yeah we have more resources to share. Cool. Yeah, I think one thing I think it was Barnabé who brought this up before, but like that potentially looking at like a shorter block horizon makes more sense after 1559 because of how quickly the base fee moves. So I'm not sure if that's something you're able to backtest, but um, I think that would be really interesting, like to see, you know, do you get better estimations if you look at like 10 versus 50 versus 100 versus even like something like five because um, because the base fee can basically double, I think, in like six blocks. Um, and, and, and that means like if, if we're in a spot where it's doubling really quickly or going up pretty quickly, the tips will be going up quite fast, obviously. Um, and you'd want to adapt quickly to that. Whereas like, if, you know, if that demand spike is over, the tips will probably go back down quickly. Um, and, and again, you'd want to adapt quicker. So yeah, it, yeah, I, I mean, it'll be interesting to see the, the actual like live data for that. But I think as you're maybe working on like a, a V2 or, or an upgrade to it, like 
comparing different history ranges and trying to see what's like the best estimator could be really interesting. Completely, yeah, completely. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Um, Chris, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, um, I'm with Block Native, and uh, we we're, we've updated our gas platform to support 1559. It's also triggering on the 1559 fork block, so that'll that'll go live when when 1559 goes live, and uh, it basically adds to our API, um, you know, a, a max a fee cap recommendation as well as a tip recommendation. It also reports on the base fee just if you want to get it through that source instead of asking the block. Um, and initially, it's a little bit heuristic based, um, but then very quickly, it's going to switch to our full models. We just need to get actual data on those models. And the the behavior that we saw for 1559 on the test nets really didn't give us anything that we could build a model off of. So it just wasn't used enough. But that's the plan for Block Native's gas platform support. Nice. Out of interest, do you have anything on Bobston for that available already? Um, our our gas platform only runs on uh, on mainnet. We don't we don't really provide an API for the for the test nets for that. But um, we do. Uh, what we haven't done yet is uh, show what the API changes are for that. So hopefully over the weekend we'll have that. Um, we're just doing some testing now, and I want to make sure the API is reasonably solid. The payload changes are reasonably solid before we publish that. But hopefully by Monday, um, that'll be available for anyone to see the API, not to actually get the data. Cool. Anyone else have? Uh comments or just thoughts on oracles they wanted to share before we, we move on? I think, um, oh, go ahead, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so um, I also have some um, experimental code, but yeah, that's been shared. The link has been, I see now, I see and the link has been shared. So I have, so uh, there's this uh, uh, fee history API that, uh, uh, and I, 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 I wrote uh, some, um, some some some, some um, JavaScript uh, uh, oracle using this this uh, fee history API that's also supposed to be like capable. So it's also theoretically capable of, of making suggestions for like more urgent or or less urgent and more economical uh, fee options and everything. But uh, yeah, so I believe we really need the main data to to test these things. And yeah, but. Um, but once uh, Mainnet launches, uh, I'd be uh, very happy uh, to uh, like see some comments or issues opened on that uh, repository if anyone uh, wants to uh, try this, this 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 fee oracle. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Um, and yeah, I feel like a lot of this stuff, the data on mainnet will be kind of a much better indicator uh, just because all the test nets don't have sustained like more than 50% uh, full blocks usage. Um, yeah. Cool. Anything else on the oracles? I was just going to surface if anybody from Gas Now or Tai Chi or Sparkpool is here uh, and you wanted to ask any questions, um, now would be a good time. Uh, not, I'm it, no, no pressure if, if you don't have anything. But yeah, we do not have anything. We just uh, we have finished all the code that uh, are re, uh, revising and reviewing. So we are just waiting for launch and currently no uh, from our side. Okay, thanks. All right, yeah, let me double check the agenda. Um, again, this is open. So like, if, if you guys just have a question, and you want to bring something up, just go ahead. Uh, we don't really have to rely on the agenda strictly. Um, are there any wallets here who would 
be bold enough to share any screens or demos of what they have so far. I know we have MetaMask and Status here. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but it would be really, really amazing if we could see anything from you guys. Uh, I'll, I'll go first. On our end, uh, our kind of fee estimation stuff is expected to be ready on Monday. Uh, so that's not ready right now. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as soon as that is ready, I will share a, share, share a link to um, the branch along with any build instructions for anybody who wants that uh, information so they can jump in and play around with it. The kind of interface side of things is done. It's just not plugging into anything. <laughs> um, so that's no different to uh, what we shared a few weeks ago uh, inside the Figma files. So all of that stuff is pretty much exactly the same. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, Kevin from MetaMask here. Uh, we are live uh, on private beta uh, on our mobile apps, uh, which is uh, iOS and Android uh, with uh, our desktop extension uh, version, we should be uh, live next week sometime uh, on private beta as well. And when the London hard fork happens, we'll, we'll go to uh, uh, Prague soon after. I was reminded we have Rainbow and My Crypto here. So if, if either of you would like to share some thoughts or a quick update, that would be cool. Hey, this is Jen from Rainbow. Um, we decided to hold off and wait until we get more data to be able to figure out what sort of decisions we wanna make for our users, just because our goal is kind of to um, limit the, the range that we're gonna be exposing to users because there will be kind of like a vast range going up. And so um, we've kind of mapped out a few different scenarios and situations and are still debating um, kind of what our UI we want to show. Um, essentially kind of, uh, yeah, kind of trying to limit the multiple on the base fee um, and being smarter about the, the tip instead um, so that we don't have like this long tail or this huge range um, of, of like, oh, your, your, your gas price could be some large amount that might be uh, way bigger than what it ends up being in practice. Okay, yeah, and I think, um... Tim has mentioned this before, it's not unreasonable to wait and see how it plays out a little bit before deciding how to present things um, with making changes in your UI. So that's good. Um, sorry, I keep, I, I, I keep, I can only see a few names on this screen. So I'm so, uh, apologies if I keep missing wallets who are in attendance. Um, but if there's anybody else who wants to say something, just, just go ahead. I would just say briefly, Argent, we're doing the same thing um, as uh, Rainbow, so we're, we're holding off for now. Um, I think we need to be a bit confident what kind of data sources we can use for the oracles, um, and it sounds like most of, of them are kind of fine-tuning things and will be probably for a couple of days at least afterwards anyway. Um, we're eager to get it in uh, with the UX that we already have. We, we believe that it suits the, the same model, um, but it's probably going to be, I'd say, yeah, at least a week or so afterwards. A week or so from here or from the uh, uh, after, yeah, I think until we can start looking at it properly and we've got gas oracles um, with, with good estimation models, there's not much we can do. Um, so I think we'll, we'll come back to it probably about a week after um, London's gone live um, and then start digging into it and, and seeing what technical changes we can make. Great. So it, it sounds like it also might be helpful to have another call in two weeks just to share everybody's learnings. Um, but uh, we'll plan that after the fork. Uh, Leaky, do you want to talk at all about, I see there's some discussion going on about dec decimal to hex. Um, does anybody want to bring that up verbally, just so everybody's aware of it? Yeah, there, there's a change basically in the fee history. It's just for the fee history, so not for submitting um, 
And it's a bit um, a sad situation because um, for the clients, it's a bit hard because you don't really know what to use. So if you use the wrong one, you get an error. And so you need to check the client version and depending on your model, that's a bit strange. I hope we can accept both. So the current release, um, 1.10.6 still uses decimal um, and the master currently, which then will be released to um, 110 1.10.7 uses hexadecimal. That's be actually better using hexadecimal, it's more um, streamlined because hexadecimal is used for blocks in other places, but the problem is the transition basically because as a wallet, what do you actually then use? You know what I mean? Uh, sorry, which, the, you... which values are being changed? So actually two it's a block. values, and one of them is an input value and the other is a, uh, so, so uh, the block count input value and the oldest block uh, return value are both changed from decimal to hex now. So yeah. And this is tricky because uh, on one side, the JavaScript code could accept the return value both in both formats, but, uh, but then also the client has to accept uh, the input parameter, the block count input parameter in both formats, which is possible, but it's also not how it's specified now. So yeah, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's, that's the best way to go. I think the main problem is basically the input values um, because like I can, I can, as a client, I can basically check um, the value I get. Um, no, I mean the output values. Uh, I can check basically what value I get and then uh, decide on that. But the problem is if I need to send a request and not really know what to send, that's a bit of a sad situation. So, so yeah. if, if, if the node can accept both just in the transition period, basically, um, for, for a while, we can also switch that off at some point. Um, that would be nice because otherwise it's, it's quite problematic. Yeah, but right now, so right now the, the current release version that only accept decimal. So then uh, the, the proposed uh, script should also like uh, use a decimal value. So maybe that sounds like we might just get stuck with that. But uh, yeah, also if uh, Open Ethereum and Visu uh, already ha use hacks and uh, Juan, I think wrote that just now, then it's one big good either. So that's the problem that uh, right now we have a release version of GET that only accepts decimal. And then we have other clients that, uh, that accept uh, hacks. Or I don't know, maybe do they accept both? Uh, no, they don't. Uh, and at least in Open Ethereum, when I tested it, it was breaking. Um, so they only accept hexadecimal, is that right? Yeah. Uh huh. So it's not so easy. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, then it's bad either way, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. And it was probably my mistake. And I'm sorry about it. But yeah. So I. I, then, then I don't think we should uh, release this uh, JavaScript code in uh, uh, in a way that it uh, uh, uses a decimal value in the call because I mean for the fee history input value the block count because uh, that only uh, that will only work in get then and won't work in the other clients. So, are you yeah. referring to the JSON AP, the, uh, so the JSON RPC API? Are you saying that the inputs to get or are you mean the result? The input. Now, now I'm I'm talking about the input. So 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 the so the API. I'm 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 thinking about now about uh, like from the node side, so from the get uh, implementation side. So by input, I mean the fee history uh, API's input value, the block count, and uh, and that's uh, now yeah. So the currently uh, release version of get uh, accepts a decimal value there and the other clients accept a hex value and uh, the master branch of get only or is already uh, updated to hex so maybe I, I think most clients accept a quantity which is just a non-zero prefixed uh hex right the, no the the standard is everything to be hex and and then uh yeah yeah that's, that's what quantity values are right it's like uh, oh it's yeah hex. yeah the quantity is a, is a hex value yeah. yeah so so to me the issue with ethereum is that uh really if if, if seven is not released 
I might have to, as Geth is the most popular client, I might have to uh, recreate a new, well, create a new version with Ethereum that will support the, the six and then release again when seven is out. Um, because I cannot do the uh, this uh, guessing uh, stuff like in JavaScript because it's all tight. Um, so ideally, if seven was out before that, will be great. <laughs> That's Is there a plan to release 10.7 before the hard fork or would this be after the hard fork? I believe after, but somebody more, somebody closer to the Geth team can maybe respond. Actually, I don't know yet. Uh. Okay, I will reach out to the rest of the team and find that out. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I, I will try to find it out too, but yeah, uh, I just don't know it right now, but uh, yeah, it would be, it would be uh, from this, uh, uh, for this issue, it would be nice if we could, if we could do, do a fixed release at least. Because yeah, I don't think so. I don't think that uh, uh, like uh, yeah. So 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 accepting both uh, both both formats in get that just won't solve the situation because the situation is already there. And if we can do a release, then we can just change it to hex and uh, and then it will be hex everywhere, and that's like the best outcome. But uh, yeah, I think the only way to fix this is uh, to like do. Do do a, at least a hotfix release for this issue, and yeah, I will try to talk to Peter and the guys, and maybe maybe we can do it, or maybe I, they have this plan too. Yeah, I don't know. I have been testing on 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 ten seven, and to me, it works perfectly. <laughs> and hence, I released Ethereum, thinking that was gonna happen. Uh, uh, but yeah, so if you just let us know, or, or just in the in in the Discord chat, you know, so that I can plan ahead and I can, I really think that being compatible with Get is, you know, at least will touch more uh, more clients than than the other way. Uh, question for Rigmo related to this. Um, is it possible that the uh, get feed data um, method from ethers uh, does not accept any parameters right now? So right now I don't use feed data at all for ethers. I'm still using Micah's suggested hard coded one way. Got it, got it. Um, um, but what I plan to do in the future is that there's that feed data structure. Um, and so that's also rolling up gas. Like, so in V6, there will, be a, there will no longer be a provider.get gas price. That'll be rolled into fee data as well. So if you look at the result of fee data, you get inside that the gas price, if it exists, the max fee uh, per gas and the max priority fee per gas, if those exist. So in the future, at some point, once like the, the dust is settled and we know exactly what, what um, fee history is going to return, there'll be something else in there for that. But I'm also planning to make that object an actual object that has, for example, a method so that you could, for example, have get priority fee uh, per gas, like get, get priority fee as a method that you can then pass in. And that's still up in the air, whether it's going to be a number that represents a number of seconds you're targeting or whether it represents, you know, uh, fast, slow, medium, cheap, something like that. Um, but yeah, for now, none of that exists. That's just kind of like future plans. For now, it's going to, there will, there will be a, a max priority fee per gas, which is kind of like the best estimate we have, which is currently hard coded to one way, but soon it'll start pulling fee data and making some sort of educated guess based on that, if that makes sense. Yeah, perfect. Sounds good. Thank you for clarifying.
Anything else on this topic? Actually, that does bring up one quick question. Is that cert currently sufficient? Is the previous advice of hard yeah. way still? I would say two is, so one, so the, the background here, um, and I can share Barnabas posts uh, for people who want to read it. Um, Uncle MEV is in my most read things. Um, one way covers the opportunity cost of your block being uncalled. Um, if you just look at like transaction fees. Um, but the, the challenge is that since uh, 1559 was developed, uh, MEV is now a, a big thing. Uh, so the opportunity cost of being uncalled is not only you lose the transaction fee revenue and the block, you know, the block reward, uh, like the delta between like an uncle reward and the block reward, but it's you possibly lose kind of your, your MEV bundle that's included in your block, right? So what you want is you want the tip to basically offset that potential loss as well. Um, and that gets much trickier, trickier for two reasons. One is MEV rewards are very variable, right? They're not evenly distributed. Um, and two is you don't actually want to like compensate for 100% of possible MEV, right? Like when there's a 100 ETH MEV bundle, it's probably fine for a user to wait a block to not like, you know, over tip that. Um, so last time I checked, like a two GUI default gives you basically uh, compensates for roughly 50% of like historical MEV blocks. So that means that, and, and MEV blocks are only 60% of blocks right now. So that means that um, if, you, if you compensate for, for half of those, it's like there's 40% of blocks without MEV and then you're good in 38% of blocks. So like roughly 70% of the time, two GUI should be enough. And I think three GUE was enough to compensate something like 80 or 90% of MEV opportunities right now. Um, and that probably means something like, you know, 90 plus percent of blocks. So um, two to three probably makes sense, depending on like how aggressive you want to be um, compared to, you know, the, the prevailing MEV numbers. Um, and the, the link I shared from Barnabay has like kind of the formula that you, you can use to plug in that. Um, I don't think, does it link the Flashbots dashboard? Uh, it does not. Um, so the other thing that, yeah, that I've used is there's like this dashboard. If you just want to like eyeball it, there's this dashboard.flashbots.net uh, website. Um, and that'll actually show you historical MEV. Um, so that's what I kind of use. And I, I just like very roughly eyeballed it. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, you're kind of debating between like one to three GUI. So it's not like it has to be a, a perfect estimation, but yeah, unless, unless MEV changes a lot, I think those numbers make sense. I'll probably follow Frederick's example then, or Frederick, I don't know how to pronounce your name, sorry. Yeah. Uh, example of using three for now, and then we can dial back later. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, one is likely to be too low because it won't take MEV into account at all. Um, yeah. And two is, you know, uh, I don't know if you if you had like the concept of like a slow transaction two is probably like a, a good uh, good value Perfect. three yeah. Perfect. I had a question. I had a question for Fred Frederick. Sorry if I'm also mispronouncing your name from my crypto. Um, so you mentioned in the chat that you default to three way for the priority fee up to a given base fee, and then you start using the fee history. I was wondering like how do you determine when that switch happens? Like is the base the up to a given base fee is that Hard coded, or is it based on some like trajectory or or trend? Um, yeah, you, you didn't butcher my name. That was all good. Uh, basically, we we've set some hopefully sane defaults. Uh, so basically, hard coding it, but we are we will be monitoring it and like changing them on the fly if um, if it turns out that we are like completely wrong. Um, but we've we've just tried to to come up with something that that would hopefully make sense. Okay, cool. Thank you. No worries. Uh, if anyone wants to read it, I put it in the chat. I can post it again. Um, our like definitely work in progress, but our current fee uh, estimation strategy.
All right. I know Tim had requested that we add um, the discussion about requiring. Uh, sorry, I lost the agenda again. Requiring gas price uh, and the expected deprecation. Let me link to the discussion. Tim, if you want to touch on that. Sure. So um, right now, GEF and I think all other clients um, currently return a gas price value for 1559 transactions in JSON RPC. So to be clear, at the protocol level, 1559 transactions do not have a gas price field, but because a lot of tooling depends on it. Um, so GEF originally kept it in the JSON RPC, and I think other clients have have added it so far. Um, and basically uh, what it does is before a transaction is mined, we can't actually know its effective gas price on the network because it depends on the base fee. So before a transaction is mined, uh, that gas price field in the transaction will return the max priority, uh, the max fee. Um, so the maximum the transaction could, could ever pay. Um, and then after a transaction is mined, it'll return the effective uh, the effective gas price, which is uh, basically the base fee plus the priority fee that was paid. Um, so the, the goal in adding that was, you know, to, to kind of act as a, a sort of backstop and to minimize uh, breakage for, uh, in the ecosystem. Um, but it's obviously not ideal for a few reasons. Like one, this field doesn't actually exist in the transaction. Two, it's a bit sketchy that the field changes based on the, the status of the transaction. Um, so on all core devs last week, we were talking about, you know, what do we actually do about this? When do we possibly deprecate it and whatnot? Um, and one idea that we have was that we would deprecate it the first release after the next hard fork, so not London, um, but we're gonna need to have another hard fork in December, even if just to push back the difficulty bomb so that that hard fork would still contain the gas price field for 1559 transactions. Then the first release after that, you kind of deprecate it. So that means if you want to stay on the old kind of release, you can uh, you can do so basically up to the two hard forks from now. Um, so I was curious, I guess, to get all of your thoughts. And Rick has his hand up. Right. So I definitely want it in place much longer than that. The second that's removed, every version of Ethers prior to 5.4 will fail. If you like for a lot of things, yeah. even if you yeah. just try getting a transaction, just get transaction will fail if there's not a gas price there because the block like the the response is validated yeah. to make sure all the fields exist and are correct things and that was a required field back then so yeah i definitely want it longer than just the next hard fork so i mean it can what, be zero. Yeah. I, if, if you put a dummy value like if you put negative one in there i actually oh it'll work it'll be fine it's just it has to be there okay so it would work if, okay, if it returned like, would it work if it returned like null or it has to be like an integer value? It has to be, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure, yeah, it checks. Um, that was one of the yeah. changes in V V 5.4 was that it used to be big number. Now it's a allow null big number. Okay. Um, and what, what do you think would be like a reasonable deprecation schedule to like remove it completely. I mean, in my mind, if you're changing like the JSON RPC, I mean, this is also a probably a discussion I have in the, I think you're part of the other um, JSON RPC steering API calls as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's almost something I would expect. This is one of the reasons I guess why we also need a version field or something inside. Because um, uh, you can imagine if you went to like, you know, uh, JSON, like um, right now you go to your URL slash whatever and you just post something. If it was your URL slash V2, if there was some sort of versioning on the API, because right, the problem is right now you're, there's, there's no way to detect backwards that the backwards compatibility is gonna be impacted. So I mean, yeah. in my mind, until there was some sort of versioning, it should still be present. We, okay. Like removing fields is backwards breaking, whereas adding fields is kind of safe. Yep. So yep. this is one of the first times I can think of where there's been an issue. I can't remember for the the state root uh, stat when we added status, we did some of the state root. But I think state root still exists, right? Yep. So I mean that's the important thing, because it still exists and is like a a thing. 
So, I mean, I guess in my mind, I don't really want to see this go away until there's some sort of version field. Because that way you can, if you start receiving JSON RPC requests that are not versioned, if they're not uh, appending a slash v1, v2 on the end, you know yeah. this thing is broken, at least return them something gas price related. Uh, yeah. But again, I was looking the other day, there's still, I think about 50% of the users that are still on like, you know, antiquated versions of ethers. And okay. so it will break a bunch of, and it's also very spotty. Like you'll see like version 4.4.47 yeah. has a ton of downloads, but 4.4.48 doesn't, or 4.0.48 doesn't. So there's obviously a lot of these yeah. are probably deep nested dependencies in other things. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, what? So I, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. I was just uh, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, if say we introduced something like version JSON RPC around the merge, right? Like we said, you know, like the JSON R because there won't be a ton of JSON RPC changes around the merge, but there there will be, and like the the block format will probably not change, but like some fields are kind of being set to zero forever and whatnot. Like it, it feels like logically, you know, we, there is kind of this big step change in terms of functionality there. Um, do you think that would be kind of a reasonable time? And, you know, probably say like Q1 next year, if we have a new versioning system. Well, and I, that's that means, I, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I think one of the advantages, yeah, so like one of the advantages of having a versioning system is yeah. so for example, if currently your URL is one two seven zero zero one colon eight five four five, if that's the URL, then the geth node should just still continue returning a bunch of legacy values in these things. Yeah. But if it's you know slash v one slash, yeah. then you have the opportunity to to exactly like you can drop state root. You just don't you don't even need to include it. You can just throw it in the window. Yeah. Um, you can then drop gas price, and then at some point. You know, if at least then when I'm requesting without the slash v1, you can feed yeah. me back an error saying unsupported geth, geth no longer supports version zero or legacy yeah. version um, APIs. At least yeah. then there's a an error yeah. that the user is going to see. The user, you know, when their when their application blows up because some deep dependency is using an old version of ethers and it can yeah. no longer get the the gas price. At least they see a human readable thing, seeing like. The back end you're connecting to is a uh, flaky yeah. upgrade. Got it. And in the meantime, if we wanted to kind of soft deprecate it, right? Like if you start returning minus one, then it means nobody can actually rely on that field, but you potentially don't break things, right? Right. I mean, for me, minus one is fine. I can imagine a lot of scenarios where minus one is going yeah. to cost people money because now they're gonna they might be. They might be taking that and adjusting the fee for something and yeah. now they're subtracting subtracting so they're actually yeah. adding some value so maybe zero is a better zero might be the least worst option yeah. um so yeah yep yeah i can see minus one or even the worst case is like if it creates some sort of underflow and right. like you know you're adding like all your balance as a max priority fee or something exactly uh, exactly that would, that would not be good yeah um yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is really useful. So I'll share that back uh, on on the JSON RPC uh, uh, thread. Um, does anyone else have comments on that? Yeah. Let's hope nobody divides by zero. Um, I mean, at least at that point, it should fail, right? And not send your entire balance. Um, I mean, yeah, that's that's the token. <laughs> Divide by zero either gives you NAN or or inf. I actually don't know. It might give you negative inf for a negative number, but um, yeah. yeah, divide by zero is going to be bad. No. Um, cool. Uh, and I guess, yeah, talking about JSON RPC, I think Trent, you mentioned this just at the beginning, but like, yeah, we, we put together a, a, a quick document that specifies all of the changes uh, coming in. Uh, in London related to JSON RPC. So if you just wanna have one place to look, this is pretty final. Um, going forward, now that we have a separate repo for JSON RPC and whatnot, we'll probably be able to use branches and whatnot to, to track those changes, but we just didn't have those in place for London. So 
um, there is this this hack MD doc, which uh, which kind of just yeah explains like for every type of field, you know what's changing uh, for 1559 transactions, and and mentions obviously fee history being the new API that's been added. Um, aside from that, uh, there's another thing about the roadmap. I'm not sure what the question was. Um, I think you added that. Yeah, I'm not sure. Let me see. It was, I think it was about um, planning for Shanghai or what's next. I'm just getting thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure this is like the most valuable thing. So I feel like if people have other, yeah. anything else they want to discuss, we should probably get through that first. Yeah. Um, if not, there is something else that's even more valuable. So um, the ethereum.org website wants to try to highlight which wallets support 1559 and which ones don't. Um, so they're kind of looking for a list of wallets that plan on supporting it around, around launch. Um, if that's the case, if you can just leave a quick comment on the issue and say, you know, we're wallet X and we will support it. Um, yeah, that would be pretty good because then users can come and know kind of at a glance if, if their wallet supports 1559. Um, yeah, so if people just want to leave a quick issue there, a quick comment on the issue there. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, for the roadmap stuff, I mean, the thread is linked in the issue and, and I think it's probably not worth spending time on this synchronously, but, oh, uh, my, uh, Frederick, uh, just on the literally the issue I just linked uh, above your your Zoom comment. Uh, so the Ethereum.org issue. Um, if you if you could just say you know we support it from my crypto, um, that's good enough. And if we can get like a couple of those, um, yeah, it'll be at least a good start. And then it's much easier if there's like you know four or five already there. We you know you can just tell people to like submit a PR to add their their wallet in the future. Uh, but just so we can start with a, a handful of, of wallets. Um, yeah, and I guess, yeah, for the road mapping stuff, just some context, like we were discussing this on our core devs, basically uh, how should we go about naming upgrades, um, how, whether there's value in trying to stick to a very strict schedule or trying to like, uh, I guess, yeah, this is probably the best question to ask here. Um, when we're planning upgrades um, from an infrastructure or just like tooling perspective, is the biggest pain point actually adding support to the upgrade, which in this case feels like it is, but I'd be curious just like more generally, if you look back at like Berlin or Istanbul or whatnot, or is the biggest pain point kind of the timing of the upgrade, because some people think we should kind of have upgrades happen at these times and, you know, like one upgrade in June, one upgrade in, in December, whatever, no matter what. Um, and, and this way we can provide kind of more predictability in terms of like the, the tooling that's dependent on Ethereum and whatnot. And there's the other point of view that's basically if you're doing an upgrade, most of the work is actually adding support for the EIP. So we should just, you know, ship say London whenever 1559 is ready and make sure we give plenty of time to adapt. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm curious if like the predictability of the time is more important for anyone here than um, the kind of focusing on the biggest or most complex thing in the upgrade and, and, and potentially delaying the upgrade over that, um, yeah. And uh, yeah, this is the ETH Magician's thread. If people have thoughts they want to share on, on this later. Um, it's definitely a big discussion. So no pressure if uh, you want to yeah. provide your thoughts async. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I think that's all we had on the agenda. Is that 
Yeah, I, I think we covered everything, uh, including a, a couple of other things which weren't in the agenda, which is great. Um, does anybody else have other discussion points um, or lingering questions that they wanted to bring up? I, uh, I'm Sid from Coinbase. I work on Coinbase Wallet. Uh, we have a couple of colleagues here as well. Uh, thanks for organizing this call. Super helpful. Uh, I, you know, we're listening in. We noticed that we are also amongst the wallets that are still working out our plans. We want to. I think it's a combination of if working through what we think the best UX might be, but also having a bit of reluctance in in the sense that when the fork happens, we want to see what the actual data and the gas price oracles are saying. And so we're holding off maybe for a couple of weeks post launch. And it, it sounds like there's a few other wallets in, in that boat as well. Uh, we wanted your feedback on a little bit of downside planning and risk planning. What uh, do you do you feel that there are, there are any uh, red flags here around something could go wrong and cause massive disruption to our clients uh, to, or to our users? or anything that we should watch out for from the do nothing path for the first week or two, where all of our users are either getting stuck transactions nonstop or they're massively overpaying. So, yeah. So, I mean, there's two different things, right? One is just like the hard fork itself and just like, like any hard fork, you know, if I wear Coinbase, I would like freeze deposits, you know, an hour before and like, you know, monitor the situation and, and you know, wait and see what, uh, uh, you know, that everything is running smoothly and, and then turn deposits back on. And obviously, if you see a consensus issue, like the, the thing with consensus issues is like sometimes they'll take hours or days or whatnot uh, to, to, to happen. So I'm sure you all have processes for like freezing everything if, if, if you detect one. Um, so at, at a high level, like, yeah. I just say like monitor the hard fork closely. If you see anything weird, you're better off freezing things and and waiting for uh, like f for more information. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, so at, yeah. Just just to clarify, you know, we have obviously the main exchange, and then we have Coinbase Wallet, the non-custodial wallet. Oh, I'm, I'm okay, speaking, got it. I'm only about the non-custodial wallet app. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I think then with with regards, you know. Like if you keep using legacy transactions, the experience will not be worse than it is today, right? Like the, and, and all of the gas price oracles, I think will still keep reporting gas price estimates based on like the historical data and blocks and whatnot. So you will like, you will still be able to like submit legacy transactions. What happens is like, you know, when we say like your users will end up overpaying, they're overpaying today, right? Like they just, they will not get the benefit of 1559. Um, but they shouldn't overpay by more than they already are. Um, yeah, just because you can still kind of estimate based on the data that was included in historical blocks and you're basically back to like a first price auction. Um, and the, the only difference is like when you have a 1559 transaction and you set your max fee, whatever you, the difference between the base fee, your tip and, and the max fee goes back to your user. Whereas if you're just using legacy transaction, that all goes to the miner. Um, so, you know, I, yeah, it, it's not the end of the world if you want to wait a couple of weeks. Um, it also doesn't, uh, there's some comments in the chats about like if everybody waits, then like we don't get good data. That's not necessarily true because what you do get data on is uh, the block ut utilization ratio and how frequent stuff like spikes are and whatnot. So you, you yeah, like we were talking at the very beginning of this, call like how far should you look back in terms of blocks to estimate you know the the base fee uh, sorry the, the the priority fee and whatnot like you'll get all of that data um even if nobody was using 1559 you would kind of see that like you know we get spikes and we see that the the we see that the the base fee goes up you know on average every like hour or every day and these spikes tend to last an average of like three blocks or five blocks um, and that's all pretty useful. And you'll still be able to look at blocks. You know, some people, there is an economic incentive to use 1559. So some people will use it and you can still look at blocks and look like, you know, what's the, what's the like lowest quartile of, uh, of priority fees that miners accept. And if you just want to like, you know, use that as a reference that that'll be possible. Um, yeah, so I think 
Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, it's not the end of the world if you wait. Um, it, de it definitely doesn't like block the rest of the ecosystem. Um, and, and the status, you're basically kind of stuck at the status quo. Um, yeah, unless I'm, I'm missing something, but that's, that's pretty much how I understand it. That, um, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, and Barnaby, I see you have a comment in the chat. I don't know, do you want to uh, share some thoughts as well? I mean, yeah, briefly, like if you don't want users to overpay and you want to keep using today's infrastructure, but you still think 1559 is pretty nice, uh, you could just, just set the max fee parameter to whatever you were going to set the gas price of a user and then tune down the priority fee to two or three. So what you're doing, if you're not using 1559 is your legacy transaction is just converted, like the gas price is taken for the max fee and for the priority fee. So you're not getting the benefit. So you could just, yeah, whatever gas price you were going to set, just set that as max fee and use a very small priority fee, something like two or three. And most likely, um, I mean, you will never pay more than the max fee, which is the gas price anyways. And most likely you would pay less as well. Any other questions? I have a question about timing. I just want to confirm. I think uh, Kent mentioned earlier that uh, the hard fork will happen on 12 UTC on the 5th. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's, it's always tricky to estimate those. The closer we get to it, the better the estimates get just because of the proof of work drift, right? Uh, but right now it's scheduled for um, uh, I think less than 12 UTC, more like 10 UTC, 10 PM UTC. Um, yeah, it's actually been, it's actually moved a bit in the past day. So. Um, oh, it's, it's moved that much? It moved by two hours. Yeah. In the oh, past okay. I, so, I thought you said, I thought you said PM. I was like, whoa, that's quite. Oh, point. sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. No, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, actually wait. No, that's still 12. Um, no, you're right. It's still scheduled for 12 UTC. Um, scheduled. <laughs> yeah, scheduled. Um, but yeah, definitely check this. Like within 24 hours of the fourth, usually you have a pretty good like estimate down to the hour. Got it. Uh, this is helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And there's two. Uh, Ether nodes also has a countdown. Um, so like, and, and they, I think they kind of vary in which data they look at um, because they tend to be off by like one or two hours each. So like, if you want to, if you want a good window, you can basically set, you know, both the ether nodes and the ether scan one and, and you have like a high probability that it's, it's between those two. I'm just seeing a comment from Matt about the testnet stuff. So we did spam the test nuts, but um, so like definitely the mechanism to change the base fee was was tested, but it wasn't consistent, which is what we'll see on mainnet, which is like consistent usage and then spikes on top of that. And not not run by a, a spam bot. Um, organic demand is always going to be a little different. Sorry. I think that's everything. And we're right at time. We filled up the hour with delightful discussion. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. And I think we turned up some, some points which uh, I don't think we had seen before. So this has been really helpful. Um, this will be uploaded where the other videos are. I think that's the Ethereum Foundation YouTube channel. And we will also have notes for it as well for you to share with your colleagues who weren't able to attend. Um, so yeah, the, the last thing I think Tim mentioned a while ago is if you are a wallet that is supporting or when you do, just leave a comment on the ethereum.org repo mentioning that you support this just so users are aware of their options. And then um, the other thing was, 
I will, it sounds like it would be helpful to have a call in a few weeks after London when we can have some data, um, maybe have a presentation from Barnabé. I'm sure he's got all sorts of great ideas about how to present this stuff. And um, we'll have a much better idea of how this is actually working out in the wild and get everybody to share their, uh, their progress. And then there's the other things of the discussion on um, fee history and I think that was maybe maybe that was the only thing. Tim, was there anything else? Uh, yeah, there's the, well the JSON RPC gas price stuff. So I'll make sure to update that yeah. thread uh, based on your comments, Rick. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Um, and if I emailed you, that means I have you on a list. And if you want to add any of your other colleagues, just let me know. And uh, we'll make sure to invite them in the future. Cool. Cheers, everybody. See ya. Bye. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.